Amen? Amen. 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 All right. So, while you're still eating your dinner, uh, if you haven't gotten dinner, I believe they still definitely still serve you. You can grab the song. Uh, we're going to go ahead and pick up our Smyrna Baptist Church, what we believe and don't give church convictions. And tonight, what we believe about sanctification. And this is all I want to do to start this off because I have three or four slides I want us to walk through. Uh, just popcorn out. What I mean by popcorn out, one word, if you remember that game, uh, first word come to mind, but don't give me the first word come to mind. <laughs> what word does come to mind or what idea comes to mind when you see the word sanctification? Sanctified. Set apart. Holy. 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 Purified. Righteous. Good. Any others? Any others? Most fresh. Oh, I got it. Consecrate. Consecrate. Good. Good word. Any others? Saint. Saint. Yes. Come from the same root word, right? Hagias. Any others? Say it again. Sanctity. She just changed the endings of the word. Sanctity. Any others? Any others? Uh, what about uh, if you go a little bit theological, positional? So what would be the other one? Just. Out of position, or the, the past position. Talking about justice. No. Because that's positional. Talking about sanctification. Positional sanctification. So that's positional. There's a positional aspect where we have been set apart in Christ. Christ is our sanctification. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 28 through 30. Glorification. Say it again. Okay, so glorification. There is an aspect of sanctification where we will be perfectly set apart. We're going to be all in all. All in all. <laughs> so what is it in the middle? Of those two. Progressive. Progressive. There we go. Progressive. Progressive. Moving forward. Becoming. Being changed. And so when we study sanctification and talk sanctification, and you'll see in our statement, it is referencing from last week. Remember, we got saved last week. Remember salvation last we got week? Saved. <laughs> we got saved last week. And we discussed the salvation of God and, 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 and all of that that's accomplished in Christ. But then we know there is a sanctification process that we are living in right now. You're living in it right now. So, here is our statement. Are we going to read together? Of course we are. We're family. <laughs> One, two, follow the green dot. Ready? Read. By the word of the Holy Spirit, the word of God, and the church of God, the believer is being brought into an intimate fellowship with the triune God. The activity of intimacy with the triune God is a believer being conformed into the image, mind, flesh, and body of Christ. The believer being conformed into Christ's likeness is preparing the believer for eternity in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So notice the verbs that's highlighted. All of them are what? Being brought. Being conformed. Uh, is preparing. Isn't that part of the system? The believer is what? It's a 
ongoing yet process. It's something that's active now, and it is an ongoing process. Because you know, and I know, after you got saved, you didn't walk out. You was really excited that day. Mm -hmm. You probably really excited for about a month. <laughs> and so I'm looking, I don't know if I made it a good month. Before you felt, <laughs> yeah, they said we just got saved last week. And you were really excited. Then you had to go to work on Wednesday morning. <laughs> and you find out, I may be saved. I'm not right yet. My thinking is not right yet. And so now we're going through this process. And the goal is not for you to become your best you. The goal is to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So, sanctification, growing to enjoy Jesus. That's the first, just the first paragraph. By the work of the Holy Spirit and obedience to the word of God, the believer is being brought into an intimate fellowship with the triune God. There are multiple texts that we can grab for sanctification. Multiple texts. Uh, so I, gra I grab the ones that seem to speak directly to what's in our state. Uh, this comes from 1 John chapter 1, 5 through 7. The idea of being brought into an intimate fellowship. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that... I guess we can read the text together, right? Mm -hmm. So let's do that together. One, two, ready, three. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. For if we say we have fellowship with him while we are in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus my Son cleanses us from all sin. So, it is the process where we are growing, and I just tagged it, growing to enjoy Jesus with this idea of koinonia with God that allows us to experience Christ and the forgiveness of Christ and the grace of Christ as we walk in the light with our God. And later he explains that much with more detail of what he means by walking in the light and so you can read 1 John. Amen. <laughs> Sanctification, changing to reflect Jesus. So we talked about intimacy, growing, becoming more intimate with God. Now we're talking about why, what is God doing as we are walking in the light and becoming more intimate with God? God is changing us. He's changing you. So, it is true. You do not clean up yourself and fix up yourself to come to Jesus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you ain't gotta you ain't gotta clean up what you messed up. <laughs> Before you <laughs> and start it over again and then come. <laughs> That's not how that goes. You show up all dirty. You show up all messed up. Mm -hmm. And Christ saves sinners. Yes. And then Christ, through their life, by the work of the Spirit of God, the Word of God, the Church of God, changes. Oh, I, I missed something really important. All the problems in your life. I love you. Really? <laughs> and all the good in your life. He is using all of it from the moment he saves you to the moment somebody calls somebody and tells them you took your last breath. He is using all of it to change you into Christ. Come as you are, but when we come to Jesus, he changes. You do not stay as you are. And we can't throw that away and develop really bad unbiblical theology that suggests that God saves a person 
and he has the power to save them, but he does not have the power to change them. So there is this profession, I've been saved for 30 years, but I still act, behave the same exact way 30 years later. No affections, no change in thought, no, no turning, no repentance, completely devoid of spiritual sensitivities, one needs to check whether or not they're genuinely born again. Because yeah. this idea that God can save people but can't change them, and I don't mean they change immediately. We just said being, being, and preparing. It's a process, but where there's birth, there should be what? Growth. So, the activity of intimacy with the triune God is the believer being conformed to the image. And by image, we mean in their mind, affections, and eventually their body to the image of Christ. Because that's what God, when he saved you, that's what he predetermined you would be. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, 29. Are we ready? Read. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are all according to his purpose. For those who before knew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among the brothers. Predetermined, predestined to conform those whom he called to the image of Christ. So everything that's going on in your life is designed to accomplish this. Everything. The stuff you like, the stuff you don't like. Strength, weakness, health, sickness, abundance of money, no money, all of them. Children doing everything you want them to do. I don't know how many for that. Children doing nothing you want them to do. That's more real. Great employers, horrible employers, just and honest transactions, injustice, hardship, and being ostracized and abused and talked about. All of it is working together to make you look like Jesus. God knows what's happening. And one of my new statements. That I tell myself, you know this happening, and if you wanted to stop it, you could have. Man, that's serious. But since you did stop it, you intend to use whatever this is Man. to change me for your glory. And I have to remind myself of that. My Lord. Interesting you say that, because I think one of the things I, I had to be challenged by the Lord on that is most times we get in that situation, we want to immediately exit. We are mm. looking for a way to get back in whatever we consider to be that positive. Yeah. It's like the Lord tells me some things you just have to endure. Yeah. You can't get out quick. No. Yeah. No. You gotta sit in and stay yes. in and trust me and that's hard. That's hard to yeah. perseverance. Yes. Yes. That's being conformed. That's being conformed. You've been each yes. using it. Mm -hmm. So one of the texts like and we're gonna move on that I'm reminded of from that statement. Where that statement comes from. That's a new statement for me. I get that statement if you remember when we studied the book of 1 Peter. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6, you see, I because God, when I say dug into my heart with that text, he says, in this you rejoice after he just told us about these eternal glories and these eternal promises we have in Jesus. He say, in this you rejoice Though it is necessary that you are you are dealing with various trials, you are being grieved through various trials. And I remember reading that text, getting ready to come preach it to y'all, thinking, who determined it was necessary? Yeah. And it ain't but one that's in control. I know it wasn't me because I want to determine that grievous trials <laughs> was necessary. I would have wanted some kind of candid kind of trials. I wouldn't want. Yeah. 
God determined the trials are necessary. You also touched on that when you go to 1 Corinthians 10. You talk about he's not taking the test away. You don't take it away. You don't take it away. Because he is working in us. Everything. Everything. He's working to accomplish that purpose. And he calls it good. The third, the sanctification process is not to get you to be a really good Christian. That is not the goal. Because you can be a really good Christian publicly and not a good Christian privately. The goal ain't you being considered a really good Christian. He's preparing you to see Jesus. The believer being conformed to Christ's likeness is preparing the believer for eternity in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 through verse 3. Are we ready? One, two, ready, three. See what kind of love the Father has in his us, that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. Oh, oh, stop, I don't want you to mess that up. We ain't going to mess it up. Not yet. We. <laughs> we. Because in the Greek text, it's emphatic. He's screaming. It's, yeah, it's like he's screaming. It's not just, see, see what man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The Apostle John is the, all these years, he walked with Jesus, laid his head on his breast. And all these years later, he is still amazed that God has chosen to love him and make him part of his family. That's sanctification, where the affections grow. If anybody could sit back on their history with Jesus, it would have been John. The one that's described, the one whom Jesus loved. The only one to say at the cross. The only one at the cross. And yet, yet, and yet, all these years later, he is still, and that's why I say, you can't just read it, see what kind of love. Because it's emphatic in the text. He's screaming. He's overwhelmed that God loves him and that he's a child of God. That's why he wants us to miss that. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that we are all our children now. When are we God's children? Now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall be as he is. And everyone who does hope. as he is, and notice the language, everyone who thus hopes in him. Some, some text says everyone who has this hope yeah. purifies himself as he is pure. So the sanctification process, the goal of the sanctification process on our end is preparing to see Jesus. Was purifying yourself. Yeah. That, that, that's intentional. That's, that's intentional. That takes work. That takes effort. Yes. <laughs> that, that is exactly. It's intentional. It doesn't happen. It's not the believer sitting that, oh, God, God will change me, but I'm going to keep going. Yeah. And I'm going to. The focus is I'm going to see him. So, 
sanctification, divine power provided to sanctify. What has God given and provided that this does happen? Uh, first, we have the triune God that lives with us and is always with us and is in us. God, the Holy Spirit. So when people, we, earlier, I think before we talked about being alive when Jesus was alive and we talked about Christ, I believe, or something of that nature. We have the third person of the Trinity with you, always. And it's through the Holy Spirit, you experience the person of Christ. Yes. You experience the Godhead through the Holy Spirit, always. There is never a time as a believer, he is not emphatically, truly with you, whether you feel him or not. Ephesians 3, uh, this was Paul's prayer to the Father that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you, and notice, to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your Amen. inner being. Amen. Why? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. So the more one is strengthened by the spirit, notice where? Amen. In the inner being, notice the outcome. It's the experience of the Lord Jesus Christ in their hearts by faith. The third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, fully God or fully God, lives within us, drawing us, strengthening our soul and hearts in, on the inside so that we may experience Jesus and know him through our faith in him. We have the word of God. Jesus prayed uh, to his father, sanctify them, set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. Apart from the word of God, you will never grow in sanctification. You will never progress. Mm. That, that sanctify them, that, that is an imperative there. He basically said, Father, if you don't do this, it ain't going to happen. It won't happen. And there is a multitude of things that follow that. That is the last imperative in John 17. There's four of them, but that's the last one. And we tend to think that we focus on these last things, but they're all hinge on that. Being yeah. set apart. By yeah. God, God we're doing this work. And it's by God's word, His yeah. truth. So Christians, little Bible, struggle in the process. The more word of God, the more progression in the process. Because uh, what occurs there is what the renewing of the mind. And there are multiple texts we could have pulled for that. But that renewing of the mind. Because when you got saved, new life, affections, but that mind was still jacked up. You still only knew what you knew. You still had that same attitude. It still responded the same way. The thinking was still all crooked. All that still left. But by the Spirit of God, work of God, the Word of God, more and more He changes our thinking. And as the thinking changed, guess what began to follow? The affections. The body. Our emotions don't run us anymore. God's truth now becomes the light to our path. And then he gave us the church, God's assembly. And you will not grow apart from the church. Uh, cannot grow apart from the church. In church, you learn how to practice all in one another. You learn how to practice how to love one another. You learn how to practice how to not, not, not to tell one another off. Is that a text? Yeah, it's called forbearance. Putting up with one another. We learn how to endure one another. We learn how to give to one another. We learn how to sacrifice to one another. You learn how to live out the life of Christ amongst the people of God. Uh, God's assembly, Ephesians 14 to 16. Rather speaking the truth in love, and we know the context of this is right after he said he ascended and descended, he gave gifts to the church, so that for the equipment, for ministry, equipping the saints. But this is that closing section of that paragraph. 
rather speaking the truth and in love, speaking the truth in love. Let's start reading here, because it's about all of us. It's not about one person, it's about all of us. Ready? Read. We are to grow up in every way into him who is the head in Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which is equipped when each part is working. Wait a minute. Can we read that one more time? One, two, ready, read. When each part is working properly. How many of y'all members of Smyrna? Raise your hand. So how many of you guys are part of Smyrna? Okay, good. So let's read that part one more time. One, two, ready, read. When each part is working properly. You mean we're here to work? <laughs> now, what is produced? Makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Just some evidence. So this out of Romans 6, and Romans 6 is that this is who you now are in Christ. And this is how now this comes out of your life. This is what you'll start seeing in your life. Because you've now been identified with Christ's death and resurrection. And here's what comes out. Because in Romans 6, is all about, shall we keep sinning because grace abounds? And he begins in the first 11 verses, I believe, by reminding them, first, let me tell you what happened when you put your faith in Christ. Let me tell you what God did. And then he says, now here's what, because this is what God did when you put your faith in Christ, here, here's your new reality that, you, that should flow out of your time on the planet. And I can grab three verses contextually. There are new affections. He says, thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. It's not dry obedience. It's not pull your boots up and I'm going to go I'm gonna keep these ten rules. It's not that. It is a obedience from the, from the heart. The affections are new. So now the law of God, you hate it. Why are you always telling us what we can't do? Now you read the law of God as you're growing and you, you sound like David. His law is sweeter than honey. Yeah. Yes. How you go from I hate all the rules to no, his word is sweeter than honey. Because the affections have changed. Oh, Lord. Uh, you get a new master. Verse 18. Amen. And having been set free from sin and have become slaves of righteousness. Delete you're not set free to go be, go do whatever you want to do. That's not freedom. That's going to put you right back in bondage. You have a whole life, I did what I wanted to do, and that's, that's what he used to bring you to the cross. So you're free to righteousness. And righteousness is freedom. And then it starts out of this is the, is the new lifestyle. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitation. But just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members, your body, your actions as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So this is our statement. Let's read it one more time together. One, two, ready, read. By the word of the Holy Spirit, the word of God, and the church of God, the believer is being brought into an intimate fellowship with the triune God. The activity of intimacy with the triune God is the believer being conformed into the image, mind, affections, and body. Christ is prepared in the 
copy of scripture? Amen. Th thank you, Brother Ernest. Thank you. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. We're looking at verses 10 through verse 20, continuing our study. And after all that good sanctification, conversation. Yeah. Now we get to talk about your money. <laughs> and not that we get to talk about it. God talks about it. So you have a handout. We have some fill in the blanks. Uh, can somebody grab, they had a couple on the table back there on the end. Can somebody grab a couple of Dick Johnson? We need two up here. So Ecclesiastes, the spiritual complexities of life under the sun. How do you really feel about money? So you grab your copy of scripture, chapter 5, because the text of chapter 5 is not on the paper this time, as you can see. So you need your copy. Chapter 5. And here's the premise coming out of verse number 10. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also vanity. So there is the vanity, the chasing after the wind of loving money or wealth in the Septuagint. It's the word for agape. It's the root word for agape. You actually, the idea is you are committed to money. It's not just, I really like having a few dollars. No, no, no. It has the idea is, it is a primary pursuit. It's an agenda for you. The, what, what they like to the, see some younger people, I guess they're younger than me, like to talk about the bag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> talk about the bag. And it is your agenda. How much money you can get, that's what you live for. Uh, so it has to do with to be determined and devoted to acquiring as much as possible to the point of sacrifice. That's what agape means. It is is to love something where you are determined, it's a choice, it's a decision to do whatever you got to do, even sacrifice oneself to get whatever that is. That's the, you're committed to it. That's the, that's the idea yeah. of agape. And that's the word that's used here in the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. It is to be consistently, and that's positively, that's actively. But what promotes that? towards money. It is to be consistently discontent with the provisions and the amount of sustenance the Lord has provided. So there is a positive and a negative. And by positive, I mean active. Where you're chasing it and you are committed to getting it, doing whatever you got to do. But on the flip side of that coin, there's a negative disposition and a lack of contentment with what God has provided. Mm. That God hasn't given me everything I need. Yeah. And I am discontent with what God has given to me. And he said in verse 10, the one loving money will never find satisfaction. In Ecclesiastes chapter 2, he says, I made my works great. I built myself houses, planted my vineyards. Verse 7, I cried male and female servants, had servants born in my house. Yes, I had greater possession of herds and flocks than all who were in Jerusalem before me. I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings and of the provinces. Whatever my eye desired, I did not keep from them. Then I looked on all the works that my hand had done the labor which I had taught, and indeed all was vanity of grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. Uh, I'm a KB fan, a Christian rapper. You got this song out called Our Love. The second verse is almost a summary of chapter two. And there's a phrase, there's a couple of phrases he make in there when he talks about the love and pursuit of money. One of the things that got my attention, he says, you may die rich, but you still die. Oh, oh, amen. Yeah. 
He made that statement. He made, the, he made another statement that Ecclesiastes speak to. He says, most find themselves idolizing people who never find what they were looking for. They have it. And we idolize what they have and what they are looking for, they never find it. And yet we're idolizing it. Uh, the third statement, third phrase he makes in there, he says, every star that's, that's shining bright is actually heading to crash. But we celebrate the bright moment, even though it's heading to destruction. And we crave it. That's the idea. His point is never satisfied. Go ahead. I uh, remember, was it last week, Deacon Holland, a couple of weeks ago, they just, George Foreman, he made a statement. He said, he, you know, when he made all this money off the grill, he said, I bought everything I could buy. Everything I could buy. And when I had bought the last thing, I cried because there was nothing else to buy. Mm. Basically, that's exactly, you, you're that's only it. satisfied but for a minute. And then when, you, when that satisfaction goes, yeah. goes, now you're empty because there's you know, nothing else. Some nuts, but that verse is the same. So the inability of riches and wealth to satisfy. First, verse 10, as we read, enough will never be enough. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also vanity. Proverbs 15, 27, the one who is greedy for gain troubles his household. Uh, verse 11, the more you make, the more you need. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with, with his eyes? So the more money you get, the more you're going to need because the more people are going to come after it. Including yourself. The more you the more you spend. So the more money you make, the more you need. Wealth can be the enemy of productivity. Look at verse 12. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer when he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. Worrying. Worrying. Laziness. I listen, uh, and, and I know some disagree, but I, I, I understand Piper's position, who calls, he calls retirement ungodly. <laughs> and this is what he means by retirement. When someone retires from a profession, he's not saying that's wrong, but when the goal is, I want to retire so I can sit and do nothing. Because his argument is, God never intended for us to ever just sit and do nothing. Now you may be able to leave work to do something of service and to begin, but just to sit and do nothing, he will argue you can't find that in the Bible. And it seems here, he compares the rich person with the person that does what? Labors. That's being productive. Um, well, quick, quickly gain and quickly lost is money. Verse 13 and verse 14. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches was kept by the owner to hurt, and those riches was lost in a bad venture. And he is a father of a son, but he has nothing in his hands. He get it, he get it, he got it. And it's gone. First Timothy 6, 17. You can't trust in it. Instruct those who are rich. And notice there are believers who are rich. So money in itself is not wicked. It is always the heart towards it. 
Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches. It has no eternal value. Verse 15 and verse 16. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This is also a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? So you come here without anything, you are leaving without anything. Yes. 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 First Timothy 6, verse 7, with Proverbs 11, 4, riches do not profit in the day of wrath. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. So when it's time to stand before God, the last thing he will ask you about is how much money you have. First, because he already knows. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Secondly, it will mean nothing when it comes to your stance with him. But righteousness delivers from death. 1 Timothy 6, 7, for we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of it either. Uh, and then keeping and acquiring money will hunt, will hunt you. Verse 17. Moreover, all his days he eats in how? In darkness, in much vexation, and sickness and anger. Has it, he gets it. Always, as Vince er, alluded to earlier, worrying about getting more and protecting it and not losing it. Mm -hmm. And in this text, he has it, he's eating, but notice it's in darkness. Uh, notice sickness. Notice his heart, anger. Proverbs 23, 4 and 5 says, do not weary yourself to gain weight well. Cease from your consideration of it. When you set your eyes on it, it is gone. For wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle and fly towards the heavens. So how does the Lord instruct us when it comes to our wealth? How should we view money? How should we view money? And by the way, it has nothing to do with the amount that you have. Right. Nothing. The Lord, not the provision, is the source of joy. If you look at verse 18, verse 19, and verse 20, you're going to see these phrases. Verse 18, God has given. Verse 19, God has given. Verse 20, God keeps him occupied. God is the source of joy in the life of the believer, not how much money you have. Amen. Second, the Lord is our source and security and here is the promise of that. That the Lord is the source and security because here's the reality. Having money tends to cause us to feel secure. There's a sense of security like, okay, if something goes wrong, I'm gonna be all right. And it gives us this sense of security. The Lord never told us to trust in money as a security. He himself is our security. In Hebrews chapter 13, do what the text says, let your character be free from the love of money, being content with what you have for, here's the reasoning, for he himself has said, I will never desert you nor will I ever forsake you. 
Notice the contrast in the text. You have money as a security, or you have God as a security. That's where it's promised. Here's the text where it's lived. Yes. That the Lord is our source of security. This is a historical account where it was lived. So, the book of Habakkuk, I believe most are familiar with it. Chapter 1, Habakkuk says, Lord, you need to do something about your people. There is murder, injustice, the priest going crazy, the leaders going crazy, the people going crazy. You need to do something about it. God says, okay, I'm doing something, but you don't want to know. Habakkuk says, yes, Lord, I really do want to know. God says, I'm, the Chaldeans over there, you know them Chaldeans, them really, really, really mean people? Yes. With all them big old soldiers and chariots and horses and they have huge knives. Mm, yeah. I'm making them really, really strong. And I'm going to send them over here to chastise you. Mm. And the backer says, oh, Lord, you can't do that. <laughs> We're not as bad as they are. He matter of fact, he appeals to God's character. He says, you're too holy. So you gonna, how are you, you going to use a nation that's worse than us to chastise us? God didn't answer it. So he decided to be quiet. In chapter 2, he goes, I'm going to sit and just watch and wait. And God comes and says, now get your pen and some paper. Write this vision down. I know what the song is. Don't say the song. But you, don't want, you really don't want this vision. You don't want that vision. Habakkuk didn't want this vision. That's right. You don't want Because in this vision, God said, remember what I told you about those people, they coming. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you what they're going to do when they get here. They are going to ravish you. They're going to leave your bodies slain in the streets. They're going to strip all of your food, and it's going to lead to, eventually, cannibalism inside of your city walls. Amongst my people. And I am going to bring them in and they are going to devour you. And this is what he said. And they will have no remorse about their action. They will not get tired. They will not feel bad. They will not feel sad. They are not going to show you any mercy whatsoever. Woo. And they're going to set up their camps around your walls for three years. So that you can't come outside your walls during the springtime and bring in your product your produce, so that your people will can eat. And just after three years where there's three years of starvation in the city, then they're going to come in and they're going to destroy you and carry you away from out of Jerusalem, from out of the promised land, to a foreign land that you don't want to go to. That's what they're going to do. That's the vision. But then he says, and then I am going to judge them. For their wickedness yes. and for their murderous intent and for their evilness. I'm going to judge them and I am going to condemn them and I am going to destroy them. Habakkuk yeah. 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 says, when God got through, he said, I shouldn't ask you anything. <laughs> And he says, because when I heard your purpose and your plan, everything, my bones trembled. And I became as a dead man. And he says, my greatest fear has, is coming upon us. Because all of these things you say are going to happen, they're going to happen. And then he said, this is how he closes it out. Though the fig tree should not blossom. So there's no figs because the people then took them off, burned them, so you got starvation. And there be no fruit on the vines. Though the, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold, 
and there be no cattle in the stall. So he's saying, you said we're going to stall. Yet I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. That's a change in affections. That's living by faith. I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. When all of what you depend on to live is gone, stripped, empty, this man is fully persuaded God will deliver. God doesn't need the trees to blossom to take care of his people. God doesn't need for the, for the flock to be in the fold, and God doesn't need for the cattle to be in the stall for God to take care of his people. The people have to trust God as their security. Not how much agriculture they have, not how much cattle they have for you and I, not how much money you have in the bank. Trust God as your security. The Lord is the source of our enjoyment of the provision he has given to us. Verse 19. Everyone, well, let's read verse 18. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and to drink, to find enjoyment in all the toil which one, which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to do what? Enjoy. To enjoy them and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil. This is the gift of God. So God is the one that allows us to enjoy the provisions he has given to us. Because we know historically, you can have it and not be able to enjoy it. Yes. And history is full of people who had provisions beyond, but didn't have the health to enjoy the provisions that they had. Or they had it and didn't have anybody or family to enjoy it with. Ecclesiastes 6, 1 and 2. This is the evil I have seen under the sun. It lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possession, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them. But a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. So the freedom and the ability to enjoy whatever God has given you is a gift from God. Amen. And by the way, there are sometimes we should enjoy what God has given us. Amen. That's in the law. It's also in Timothy. It's in Timothy. Mm -hmm. He gives us riches. Yeah. The Lord calls us to enjoy the provision he has given us. He just didn't tell us to love it. So in verses 18, 19, 20, it's all about enjoying whatever it is God has given you. But in 1 John 2, he said, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Amen. Don't love the world, nor the things in it. So whatever it is, you can't live without. Maybe we love it too much. Amen. And I'm talking about the things and the stuff. The love of money and the love of Christ cannot coexist. Jesus taught no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. The provisions and the ability to enjoy the provisions he has given us is a gift, not a right. Verse 19, everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possession 
power to rejoice in him and to accept his lot, to rejoice in his toll. This is the gift of God. God doesn't owe you anything. God doesn't owe you anything. God doesn't owe you a job. God doesn't owe you an income. God doesn't owe you a car. He doesn't owe you a house, somewhere to stay. God doesn't owe anyone anything. Uh, Job 41, 11 says, Who has first given to me that I should repay him? This is God talking to Job. Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. <laughs> so we talk about, you think Acts 17, Paul talks the same way. Paul says, nobody has actually ever served God. Because God doesn't need anybody to serve him. He's not in need. God doesn't have a need. So by definition, you can't serve God as though you're filling in something, some gap in God's existence. God does not need you. He owes no one anything. You haven't preached enough. Taught enough, sacrificed enough. Where God says, oh yeah, I need to do something nice for you. God considers it, the Bible considers it a privilege for you just to be called one of his children. God considers it as a privilege that he allows you to know him. Matter of fact, in Jeremiah, God, tell, God tells us to brag. Yes, sir. And to boast. And this is what he says. He said, says let, uh, let the rich man not boast in his riches, and let the powerful man not boast in his power, and let not the wise man not boast in his, in his wisdom. But let him who boasts, this is Jeremiah, boast in this that he knows me. God tells people to boast in. Brag on the fact that God let you know him. Amen. Yet alone, do something for him. So if he gives you anything, and then lets you, to, lets you enjoy it, and then lets you, and allow you to use it, it's for him, that's a privilege. First Chronicles 29, 12, both riches and honor come from you. And you rule over all. In your hands are power and might. And in your hand it is to make great and to be a strength to all. The Lord has called us to be content with the provisions Amen. he has given us in verses 18, 19, and 20. Uh, verse 20, for he will not much remember the days of his life because God keeps him occupied and with joy in his heart. Uh, 1 Timothy verse six, chapter 6, verse 8, if you have food and cover with these, we shall be content. You got somewhere to live, you got something to put on, you got something to eat, praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Philippians 4, 
For I have learned, you see that? I have what? Learned to be content in any circumstances. Now, how do you learn that? You got to live that. You get to practice. You get to practice living in every circumstance. So, what did Paul say? I have experienced time of need and times of abundance. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of contentment, whether I go satisfied or hungry, have plenty or nothing, I am able to do all things through Christ or through the one who what? Strengthens me. And so God gives us a chance to learn this all the time in different ways. So there are times we have a lot, like normally for some of us between January and March. When I had kids, I couldn't wait till February got in. Like a little savings account. Woo, my soul used to be happy. <laughs> I got blessings for about 24 years. Got some blessings, 24 years. Now I don't get that no more. Now I can't stand Jerry. <laughs> I can't stand Jerry. I used to be over here time of abundance. January, February. Now I'm over here. How to be So whether it's a blessing or a bill that's coming for them three from, from them three alphabet people. I have to believe that he's able to strengthen me. I am able to do all things through the one who strengthens me. And here's the truth. God allows us to experience that all the time because he's training us to find contentment in him so that when you have it so you don't trust it when you don't have it so that you know you're not messed up because you don't have it you still trust it so you don't become prideful and you don't become angry uh, the Lord has called us to use his provisions give it to us for his glory and the good of others God gives us things. God gives you monies and provisions. The question becomes, how do you view what God gives you? In 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, clearly there were rich believers, believers who had a lot of abundance, a lot of wealth. Paul tells them, don't allow what the Lord has given you make you a price from a dollar. Mm -hmm. Verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, show them not to be haughty. Yeah. Don't be prideful. Yeah. Yeah. You have a little more, praise the Lord. Amen. Don't become, don't be prideful. Don't be arrogant. Yeah. Yeah. Don't try to fall. No. You, you had to get saved the same way the person who don't have any money had to get saved. Same cross. Same cross. And you were just as wretched as the people who not on your social economic standing. Uh, nor set their hopes. And notice how Paul calls it the uncertainty of Because as quick as it's there today, history has proven it'd be tomorrow. But on God. And notice it pushes God back, reminds us he's the source who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Trust in God, even if you have it, so that you're not an idolater, an arrogant idolater. Second, use your money to do good for others and to display grace. That's the glorifying God. Verse 18, same text. They are who? Those who have it 
but to do good, to be rich in good works, and to be generous and ready to share. Ready to share. Ready to share. To be rich in doing good, that they should be known. If you have it, should be known more about the good you do than about how much you have. Amen. Amen. Come on, That's it. 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 That's it.
and walk away and say, well, God don't need my money. You're right. He don't need you either. There you go. Because it was never about God needing your money. Your money, what you do with it, testify to your heart with him. There you go. God gave you the money. Practical implication. How do you really feel about your money? Uh, if the Lord not his provision, your ultimate joy. Jesus made this statement, and this often quoted text. Uh, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. This is right after he told them, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Say, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust nor destroy, nor rust destroy them, where thieves do not break and steal. For, here is his thesis statement, his intent, the heart of this. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It is not where your heart is, that's where your treasure No, it ain't that. Whatever you think is valuable, your heart is there. Whatever you think is most valuable, I gotta have this, I, I can't. And if it's money and keeping it, and you, can, you got some ways to check that, whatever that is, that's where your heart is. Because no, we good for saying, no, my heart is for the Lord. Okay, amen. Until what? Until what else shows up? So when money shows up, do I treasure Christ more than I treasure money? Because whatever I treasure, that's what I'm going to live for. Is it? When you think this, in that time that Jesus was talking more about money or the material possession, just material world. Yeah, I think he's talking about all of it. Yeah. But he used the term, don't let me have your treasure. Manners, manners, and all that. Moth and rust and destroy thieves, yeah. working in the city. Definitely. Yeah. 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 When the writer says, he says, give me two things. I'm going to give me either poverty. We all agree with that. He said, don't, I don't want riches either. Yeah. He said, lest after I be full, I deny you and say, who is the Lord? So mm. he's like saying, I don't want riches because I know what's going to happen. My heart mm. is going to be lifted up and I'm going to look at you and say, do I really need you in this area anymore? Mm -hmm. So I just, I, that, that verse is always, he said, I don't, I don't want to be rich. I don't want to be poor. Just feed me with what just continue. I need. Continue. Mm -hmm. continue. We ain't praying this. We won't do no more. Whatever you treasure, that's what you love. Yeah, that's what you're talking about. Go ahead. So I was going to say, so is, it seems that, and correct me, I might be wrong in my thinking, but Paul also in 2 Corinthians 8 or 9, one of those, yeah. when he ties our generous hearts towards one another, and he makes that statement that when you are generous towards your brothers and sisters, that you're going to always have anyhow. That's right. Regardless of the That's amount, right. you're going to always have. That's right. It is amazing how people, that it, it, it is amazing, and, it, and it's not coincidental. And, and most of us, we, you may know, I know people who it seems God keeps them with abundance. But those are some of the most sharing, giving people that I know. I mean, they give away more money. They ask about giving. They ask about, they want to know who has a need just so they can give. There were people, and I know in truth, the church we were at, who would come to me, it was a couple, a couple of couples come and say, Hey, just let me know if anybody ever need help. And they kept, like, every time they turn around, their business just expanded, got bigger and bigger and bigger. But what I remember was those same people who, I'm sorry, but. Oh, I'm just saying, my number is eight. <laughs> 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 But 
that Second Corinthians yeah. nine, yeah. God bless those who are givers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can't, ain't no, and ain't being, yeah, we, we ain't no, you know, you don't know what is it, the, the false prosperity right. teaching and nothing like that. It ain't that. Right. But God bless people who yeah. He can trust, who He trusts yeah. with riches, with wealth, because they give us. But in that passage, also. It wasn't like they were rich. They not they, rich. They, 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 they Matter of fact, they, they were, were in poverty. Yes. yes. They were in poverty. So that's what we and gave sacrificial love. Yeah. I know they did that Paul when he was in their journey. Yeah, they the were Philippian church. They were giving all the answers to the Lord. Well, even in this one of the passages that we read, Paul said, I learned to be content. Even when I'm hungry and I don't have anything. Amen. Amen. And then we talked about this before in Hebrews. It says, and there were some of these faithful that were not like Abraham and Moses and David and, and, and these other people. The world was worthy of these. And they were naked. That's right. They were hungry. These were my faithful. Amen. 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 So let's pray. Our Father, we thank you uh, for your truth. Uh, that you don't you don't pick and choose what you're going to tell us um, because everything belongs to you. And whatever provisions you've given us, whatever amount of wealth or income you've given us, Father, help us first to be honest about our hearts towards it today. No, don't let us get away because that's just as much issue of sanctification mm -hmm. that testifies to who and what we love. And we don't want to be idolaters yes. 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 where we truly do love and trust in, in riches. Whether we have it or whether we don't have it. But we fully persuaded somehow that if I had more, we'll be better. Mm -hmm. Father, help us to recognize that we are okay now because you are our God. Yes. And you are our provider. Yes. You are our security. Yes. Help us to trust you. Yes. And help us to demonstrate that trust in you by how we handle whatever it is you give to us. Yes. So if we have been fearful when it comes to, to monies and wealth, and have not been trusting you, forgive us, Lord. If we've been stingy with what you've given us, forgive us, Lord. We don't want anything competing with you as our treasure. Because we're going to leave all that stuff here anyway. So help us we need you to do this to turn our affections towards you with the monies and the resources you've given us so that we will testify with Paul it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.